Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. For come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're in limit to you, the Kansas State sporting news you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right on the side. Connor Balthazar. And welcome to this week's weekly recap where we have exactly one piece of good news. And granted, that good news is very, very good for the women's catskitball team. But we're just going to dive straight into it. But before we do that, we do want to thank the sponsors of this show. And that is Greg Arthur and Grandma. Thank, thank you, Grandma. You, Grandma. And if you want to have your name right out at the beginning of every single episode, as well as support the show, please be sure to check out the official supporters link in our podcast bio. But let's just dive straight into the biggest and perhaps best news in the K-State realm. And that is the commitment of, at this point, I believe, top 10 player for the women's basketball team. And that is 2025 guard Jordan Spicer, who this is a legitimate recruiting win. Not only because she's a five-star, but also because K-State was competing with the likes of Iowa, who genuinely believe they had this recruitment locked up to a funny degree where I randomly started seeing Iowa fans get upset about this, which that should sort of let you know how big a commitment it is where a K-State fan is seeing tweets from Iowa fans expressing disappointment about a women's basketball recruit. (laughs) Yeah. Um, this person was not like heavily on my radar. I was like familiar with their name, but I wasn't like expecting a commitment at all. So like when I saw the MIDI signal go out, I was just like, oh, all right. Like, I guess we'll wait and see. And then I just random five star drop out of nowhere. And I was like, whoa, like, that, that's pretty huge. Like, I don't know if this program's ever brought in a five star um, out of high school. I think maybe Chrissy Carr might have been a five-star, but we also hired her dad to the staff. And that's pretty much <laughs> that doesn't me count. in my NIL. So <laughs> like that, I was cheating, basically. Um, but Spicer, um, she also, she just got a ratings bump on ESPN. So she got the uh, um, never-before-seen K-State bump uh, from committing to the Cavs. Because she when she committed, she was the 20th ranked player. was still a five-star, uh, but a just this past week, a new set of rankings came out from ESPN and uh, she jumped all the way to number 10 in the country. So uh, that's a a pretty substantial jump once you get uh, um, to this point in the rankings, Uh, especially at this point in the recruiting cycle, you don't see a ton of uh, heavy movement back and forth, but Spicer has done something to get the attention of the, uh, uh, rankings people at ESPN and uh, um, all of a sudden we've got ourselves a top 10 commitment for women's basketball. Yeah. And I think the other commits, I don't remember her name, but I think she's also a top 50, isn't she? Ania Foy. And yes. Uh, well, I think she, yes, she is. She's 45th. Okay. Uh, so she is a, a four star um, on ESPN on on three which they've recently started doing women's basketball rankings. Spicer's 18th, I think, in the country, but they also haven't updated since the commitment like ESPN did. Uh, and for some reason, 18th on on three is like a four star. Like they only have like 10 five stars or something on on three as compared to ESPN, who has like 35. So not a lot of consistency there, but um, no, two very highly rated um, commitments for Jeff Mitty and the staff. Uh, so they are clearly selling, uh, that there's going to be a lot of playing time available, um, after this, uh, core seniors, uh, makes its way through, uh, cause we're going to be turning over probably the entire starting lineup unless Zy Walker starts over, uh, one of the Glenn twins. Uh, so I, I would imagine that, you know, like there's tons of minutes ripe for the taking and that's a pretty, uh, enticing selling point as well as uh, I'd imagine probably some uh, um, not insignificant NIL backing. I don't really know anything about NIL backing when it comes to women's basketball. That stuff gets circulated a little more for football, men's ball. Uh, But I'd imagine that that's got something to do with the recruiting uptick, but that's just speculation. Yeah. I mean, it it seems as if K-State is very competitive in just about every NIL market which, you know, that's pretty based. That's pretty cool. I like that, actually. But talking a little bit about Spicer's game, shooter. 
I mean, that's probably the the best way to describe her is she honestly might show up whenever she gets here in 2025. She honestly might show up and be the best shooter on the team. <laughs> and that's not disrespect to the others. She's just that good. <laughs> yeah. Um, she is a, a dominant uh, basketball player. Last year at uh, the high school level, um, she averaged, I think, about 23 points per game. Uh, and uh, then uh, she recently in the summer uh, AAU circuit had a game where she went 11 of 13 from three uh, and dropped, uh, I think, 40 uh, in that game. So, I mean, like those – uh, yeah, your reaction is correct, Ace. Like there is not an objectively better reaction than simply laughing uh, when you hear uh, stats such as that. For example, another laugh-worthy stat is uh, Caitlin Clark getting freshman All-State um, as a high school soccer player and scoring 26 goals in six matches. Uh, verified stats, and <laughs> that that's laugh-worthy. Uh, this stuff from Jordan Spicer is, is along the. Uh, uh, the same lines and we look at a 24 sevens uh write-up on her uh, um they uh which i am just now noticing that 24 7 even has women's basketball uh, recruiting rankings uh, but uh they said that she might be the best spot up jump shooter in the entire country in her class and if there's one thing that k-state has been missing and the whole time of this podcast that we have been saying over and over and over, if we could just do X and this team be really, really good, that is shoot three point shots consistently. And it seems we have identified that uh, short shortcoming after uh, five or 10 years. And uh, we are now making an effort to rectify it. Yeah. Which, I mean, we tried to rectify it through the transfer portal with people like Gabby Gregory and, I don't know is, I mean, Poindexter is more of an all rounder. She can shoot threes, but I mean, she's just sort of an all round forward. I, I think this is the first time that we've gotten like a long range, not necessarily a long range assassin, but you know, a consistently good three point shooter from the high school realm, because even Taryn, she was good from three, but her game was pretty much always passing. I mean, and don't misunderstand. She's still a really, really good passer, but she's not Jordan Spicer from three. No one is no one that we've seen come to K-State is Jordan Spicer from three. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, oh, another thing that wasn't mentioned, uh, she brings really great size as well. She's six foot one. Uh, so she's, I think, the same height as Serena Sundell. Uh, I think Serena's six one. So it's pretty, I mean, that's a, a great replacement right there. And Jeff Mitty loves uh, um, to have a, a really long and athletic guard because uh, he can just do so much uh, with uh, clogging pass lanes uh, with a, a long and athletic guard. Uh, but yeah, um, I mean, back to the Iowa stuff. Uh, that, like, I, I remember when I saw that Spicer was like announced that she was going to be committing like soon after the Mitty signal, the only thing that was giving me pause was. Uh, um, all the Iowa fans <laughs> and, yeah. uh, like, oh, okay. They, they probably know what they're talking about. You know, they've become a fan base that's super plugged into women's basketball. And then she committed to us and they were shocked as well, uh, <laughs> so, which goes to show that even in the modern era of recruiting, where it seems like every decision is leaked out beforehand and like everyone knows what's going on at all times, there can still be surprises, which when you're on the good end of a surprise, I mean, like, there's nothing quite like it, I think, in recruiting to get, like, a surprise commitment from, like, a, a really highly regarded prospect. Uh, but, no, it's a, a pretty uh, phenomenal recruit recruiting victory uh, for K-State. I'm, I'm not really sure uh, uh, there's any better way to put it. Uh, but she's uh, more than just a shooter. I mean, like, obviously that's her her MO, but uh, she averaged almost 10 rebounds a game uh, last year, Missouri class five, uh, which that probably won't be consistent uh, getting into college. Well, I'd imagine it's six foot one. Uh, she's pretty consistently one of the tallest players in the court, uh, any court she plays in, in uh, high school ball. But no, this is a huge, huge, huge commitment. And 
I think in the calendar year, it's up there with Lincoln Cure and probably Coleman Hawkins as the biggest recruiting victories for K-State. I might, I don't know, I'll, I'll just put them in that tier. I won't try and separate them, uh, but they uh, is absolutely massive for the women's basketball team uh, going into next season. Because, again, she's a senior in high school this year, so she will join the team next year. Yeah. And that was actually going to be my my next sort of question is like adjusting it for a sport, which is the bigger commitment, Lincoln Cure or Jordan Spicer. <laughs> so you preempted uh, the question there. <laughs> um, if forced to make a choice, I think there's a pretty compelling argument for either of them, because I think it just depends on how you adjust the context or the lens that you view it through. Uh, cause the Lincoln Curie five-star commitment is massive because that's just completely unprecedented for K-State football. Uh, and that was keeping an in-state guy home. Uh, even though we kind of knew the whole time that K-State was leading, there were like some setbacks, but K-State pretty much led the whole way with Lincoln Cure and show that they were able to keep a highly regarded in-state guy home and fend off uh, some suitors that maybe if he wasn't a Kansas kid, he probably considers a little bit more uh but then you have uh jordan spicer on the other hand who kind of came out of nowhere for us i'd imagine it's the total opposite for the coaching staff um but i mean you go out and beat iowa who's uh, been in national championship games you know pretty recently and uh you know like just the last couple of years they've been in there twice and uh now it's uh um, spurning them as well as uh, also spurning uh, North Carolina and TCU, who TCU's kind of been on a, a hot streak recently in terms of recruiting for women's basketball. Uh, they've brought in some massive portal pieces, uh, including uh, um, Haley Van Lith. Um, they had uh, somebody last year who I cannot remember her name. Uh, uh, but was it one of the Miami twins? No, no. it was uh, the, She was really tall. She got hurt. Uh, for a while. Um, I can't remember uh, her name off the top of my head, but um, um, that was TCU's been making some moves too. And so they, they've gone from like a perennial doormat in the big 12 to like, all of a sudden they're like right up there with like everybody else. You know, they, they modernized kind of the snap of a finger. Uh, but I think I might give the edge to, I can't really, I, I can't really, pick like in a vacuum i really i honestly don't know which one i would pick um maybe 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 lincoln cure um just because of how unprecedented it is for football um to get a uh, five-star commitment particularly the difficulty being um that there's so many more roster spots in football so it's so much easier to hoard five stars uh, whereas in basketball, um, pretty much if you're a power four team, you're probably going to land a four star side. I mean, even Bruce Weber was getting like at least a four star or two and like, not like it wasn't super rare for him to do that. And Nigel Pack was like a pretty highly rated four star. I think Celta Miguel was like a right on the border four star. So like not unheard of in the basketball side, but that's just kind of a ranking difference. Um, we're kind of splitting hairs there. I think the point that ultimately needs to be made here is that Jordan Spicer is just an incredible get uh, for Jeff Mitty and reaffirms the uh, Jeff Mitty cam recruit um, um, stereotype, I guess, that we've always thrown at him. Uh, but um, no, I'm, I'm really happy with that. And I'm now all of a sudden getting a little bit more excited for the uh, post Aoka Lee, post Serena Sundell, post Glenn Twins era. Yeah, which difficult to do, but it'll just be a, a new crop, especially with how high I I feel like I'm, you and I are both equally high on Eliza Maupin, but I feel like I'm, I'm one of the few on the Imani Lester train. So. I, well, someone's got to be the conductor, man. And it might as well be you. <laughs> So welcome to the family, Jordan. And um, all right, so now we get to talk about where our patience is running very, very thin. Uh, let's start with volleyball. Uh, first match to talk about was up against North Carolina in the home court. K-State ends up falling to a gentleman's sweep. 
winning the first set 28 to 26, then losing the next three, 25 to 13, icky, 25 to 23, and then 25 to 22. And um, you can tell when I say our our patience is running thin, uh, it extends to the next match as well, but we'll get there when we get there. But, I mean, this is probably the biggest kick to the groin that we have had for like had like hyping up a a team in the show's history. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think it's close because we've hyped up like the women's basketball team before and like Aoka Lee tears her ACL and they don't do as well, which like that's like a uh, like insinuating circumstance. Last year the men's basketball team, we were really excited about them and thought they were a tournament team. And they lose Naquan Tomlin and they lose, I don't know how important it was, but they lose Quez Glover as well. Um, and Tyler Perry uh, was just really consistent. Uh, so somewhat extenuating circumstances, somewhat just didn't live up to the hype. But this one, there's like not really a discernible reason as to why things are going the way they're going, which makes it, I think, all the more concerning. Um, but yeah, it has been a all-time brutal start to the volleyball slate uh, for uh, the volley cats. I mean, woof. Yeah, no, this is, it, it's, it's kind of bad. I'll be, I'll read through the leaders in the North Carolina game. In terms of kills, Aaliyah Carter led with 16, Meg Brown, 13, Liz Gregorski, five. Speaking of Liz Gregorsi, she tied for the lead in aces with two, with Simone Sims with two again. Leah Carter hit one. In terms of blocks, Meg Brown had three alongside Mansky Jones and Brenna Schmidt with two. In terms of assists, Izzy Shulshevsky, yes, I can say it now, had 41. Ella Larkin had four. Liz Gregorski had two. And in terms of digs, Ella Larkin had 17. Simone Sims, 16. And then Izzy Shulshevsky, 13. So, I mean... Aaliyah Carter had an okay day. Yeah, she had a lot of kills. Uh, she had a lot of errors. Uh, 16 kills uh, with 12 errors on 65 attack attempts. I mean, she had her moments for sure. Uh, but the big issue this year uh, with Aaliyah Carter has uh, um, mainly been uh, just, like, hitting right in the blocks. Because, um, I mean, they're – like, she's getting pretty focused on – um, by uh, opposing teams. And so they like, have been taking advantage of that. And um, uh, she's hit into a ton of blocks um, early this season. I was at this match, and the first set was fantastic. It was so much fun. And we ended up grinding out that like extra points of victory. And I was like, wow, that was super fun. And then the next set was just such a punch in the gut that uh, – uh, the next two, I, uh, um, like we had our chances in the next two, and we just could not capitalize, which uh, is becoming a running theme uh, with this team, is uh, having our chances and uh, very quickly losing them. Uh, so I, I don't really have a whole lot else to say about this uh, match against North Carolina other than we absolutely could have won this, but 33 attacking errors is pretty much insurmountable uh, for most teams. And it's concerning that our attacking numbers were as bad as they were. Um, we ended up a little over 10% hitting wise uh, at 10.9. But uh, at one point in that last set, uh, we were down at like probably 70%. So, or not 70, uh, seven, I should say. And, so we were just doing horrid, uh, hitting the ball tons and tons and tons of errors, hitting into tons and tons and tons of blocks. Um, just could not get anything going, really. It was just a nightmare. Yeah. And then the next match wasn't any better in case they ends up getting swept by UC Santa Barbara. 26-24, 25-22, and then 25-23. I'm not even going to be optimistic and say each of the sets were close. I mean, moving to two and six on the year. I mean, there's, there's no other way to put it. That's bad. 
Yeah, I was thinking about going to this match, and then I decided not to. I'm glad I did not, uh, because this, this is a pretty brutal uh, way to go, losing all the sets close, and uh, all of them, they were in it. Um, I think that second set in particular, they were tied at 19 all. UC Santa Barbara goes on a three-point uh, run. We call timeout, and we go on a three-point run. Then they call timeout, and then they go on another three-point run and win the set. Uh, so that was the moment where I think uh, we were done for. Um, but starting to become a theme with this team, keeping it close, having lots of opportunities, and then kind of blowing it uh, at the end. Um, you think at some point it averages out? Um, I hope, uh, because I like, like at some point they have to be able to uh, at least luck their way, I think, into uh, getting uh, some some gritty wins. Uh, and they cut down on the errors in this one pretty significantly, uh, just 16. Uh, so that, that's way better. Um, but the issue uh, remains that they just uh, – um, just cannot pull off these close ones. Uh, that and uh, the defense has been really spotty uh, this year too. The frontline defense has been a, a major question mark. Um, and our back line on a digging out um, solid uh, hits has not been great this year. We haven't really found a good replacement for Mackenzie Morris. Um, like this team is very obviously missing Mackenzie Morris in a very bad way. Uh, I, I, <laughs> we have Mackenzie Morris in this team. We we're probably 500 at least. Um, so uh, I guess that says about where we're at. But yeah, it's a, a tough sledding right now for yeah. the other uh, Cats. Yeah, and I, I feel like that's all we really need to say there because uh, we sort of led off with the patients wearing thin. Uh, we never had any patience for the soccer cats. <laughs> so they, they ended up losing 2-0. Um, West Virginia had the exact same amount of goals as K-State had shots. Yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah, this was just a really bad match. Uh, kind of a return to earth, the combat down to earth, I guess. Uh, West Virginia, we've known as a great soccer program. They have been for a long time. Um. Yeah, Casey, after uh, really giving Colorado a run for their money, uh, just uh, at least statistically got eviscerated um, against West Virginia. Like 2 0 probably doesn't do the separation justice. Again, I'm doing a lot, I'm doing a lot of reading between the lines here because I uh, did not watch this game. Uh, but it's pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so, it's been a um, the the in season non revenue sports uh, at least the major ones uh, volleyball and uh, soccer it's been pretty rough. Uh, I think the golf teams they both won the uh, Colbert Hills Invitationals uh, for both the men and the women, which I would hope so. They practice on that course a lot, uh, so they should know it pretty well. Um, other than that, um, oh, I saw a picture. Uh, from K State Athletics, when the rowing team was practicing a few days ago, there was a rainbow over uh, Tuttle Creek, uh, and that was really pretty. That was nice. That's very nice. I'm glad. So, so yeah, the end of the week. Yeah, that's the happy news segment for the non revs this week. Have any uh, final notes? Yeah, nothing to be wacky about this week. No, sorry, I keep talking over you. No, you're good. You're good. It. This is this is a very casual show, where we we just we just talk, and that's a deep drive to left field by Castellanos, so it'll make it a four to nothing ball game. Speaking of Major League Baseball, how about Shohei Otani? Yeah, first 50-50 season in history. It's crazy, yeah. and not even to. I mean, obviously yes, to do that, but beyond that, to uh, elect to not just do that in this game against the Marlins, but to completely humiliate the Marlins as well, I thought was a nice touch. Um, a little uncalled for, but definitely funny. Uh, I mean, doing six for six, 10 RBIs, two doubles, three home runs, two stolen bases, uh, and the Dodgers win 20 to four. 
against the Marlins. Uh, wow. Uh, well, I don't follow Major League Baseball super closely. Like I, I box score watch and I sometimes watch if it's on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I, I have spoken to reliable sources and they've said that a 50 stolen base, 50 home run season that no one's ever done before is actually a pretty significant achievement. Uh, so, Pete, what are you doing, man? <laughs> Get in the recruiting trail. <laughs> Get after this guy. Well, didn't we didn't we sign someone who like was it Shintaro? Yeah, Shintaro anyway. Yeah, anyway. Well, like you someone... assuming that they know each other just because? <laughs> no, I was saying that. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I... <laughs> wow. I was saying, like, wasn't there some really annoying guy who was comping into Shohei? Oh, yeah, there was. No, you're right. There was a guy that was, uh, like, uh, saying that he could be incredible. I think, honestly, that might have been, like, more racist because he was just like, yeah, this guy is, like, pretty much Shohei Otani. He's, like, the Shohei Otani college baseball. It's just a joke. What do you mean? <laughs> so, I don't know. He's supposedly supposed to be really great. I mean, like, regardless <laughs> of the Shohei comparisons or not. Uh, but, um, Oh, we can do an impromptu wacky segment of the week. Uh, how about uh, KU's uh, stadium fiasco? <laughs> <laughs> Who could have seen this disaster coming? I the the best possible outcome is a uh, <laughs> Lance Leipold leaves. They decide it's not worth it. Shutter the football program, <laughs> and they have a concert venue. I guess. Pitt State moves up to FBS. <laughs> it's a long commute for uh, the locker rooms, but you know I think they'd take it. <laughs> yeah, we can uh, promote a uh, what's the um, NAIA that's really close by? Is it Baker? I think it's either Baker or Ottawa. Uh, they're probably both close, so they they can share it. Uh, <laughs> it's probably like it's probably so much bigger than they're used to. Uh, for a stadium that they could probably both play at the same time. I think <laughs> like just split the field in half. Arena league. Yeah. I, who says no, not I, not me. <laughs> yeah. What a uh, fiasco they have going on over uh, in Lawrence. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with what we're talking about, cliff notes are uh the entire project uh, is now at its full budget, I think, and they have only done half of it. And uh, they have to demolish an entire side of the stadium they weren't planning on doing yet in order to build things that are necessary for them to get the revenue to build that side of the stadium in the first place. So, and they also, this is not an allegation. This is just a like hypothetical and a uh, completely neutral observation. Uh, it, it seems as though they may have uh, misled the state a little bit in how uh, these uh, state funds were going to be used. Um, you know, again, that's not an accusation. That's uh, I'm just saying it. It's an interesting application of star bonds. Yeah, I. Yeah, uh, we don't want the the <laughs> bar examiners to ask any further questions. So. We will be moving on. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> but thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. If you want to follow or contact the show, you can follow us just about anywhere at Aggieville A Cats. And if you want to email us, we're Aggieville Alley Cats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I'm at AC Edward 00. I'm at Connor Bob Store, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store and the supporters link both found on our podcast and Twitter bios. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State Sporting News you so love. Stay safe.